and our next guest, I hope, is going to just talk us through it. One of the reasons he's here, one of many reasons actually, is that there's a press release today which begins, I'm just going to quote this first sentence, any agreement that might be reached in Copenhagen today will condemn coral reefs, low-lying island nations and, and all low-lying coastlines to extinction because none of the targets being discussed here are adequate to protect them. It sounds alarming. Is it as alarming as you, as this says? Well, yes, but not immediately. Um, this is a long-term issue. Um, I think the fundamental problem here, uh, well, people are focused whether people will agree or not on any targets, but my point is that none of the targets that are being proposed are adequate to protect the most vulnerable ecosystems and the most vulnerable habitats. And that's because people have essentially deluded themselves over the implications of the IPCC reports. And the fundamental problem is that when we increase CO2, the response of the global climate system in terms of the temperature increase and the sea level increase actually take thousands of years to be fully expressed. Now, IPCC was given a political mandate to use models to calculate what the response would be in 10 years, 20 years, you know, 50, 100 years. But the point is, at best, that covers only one-tenth of the response. And so pe people have really deluded themselves. Now, if, if we actually look at the real long-term climate data, and my, all my work is based on the real long-term data from Antarctic ice cores, from deep sea sediments, from coral reefs, and so forth, um, one can use that data to calculate what the sensitivity uh, and long-term global changes of sea level and temperature are to CO2. When one contrasts that to what the IPCC model, um, you know, the sensitivities in those models, one finds that they are way too low. That is to say, they, ca they, they, they conclude that the changes will be small, and much smaller than, than the, the data actually shows. Now, to give some concrete examples of that... Before you do, before you do that, can I, just, I just want to check something with you. I'm talking to uh, Dr. Thomas Goreau, uh, president of the Global Coral Reef Alliance, and actually a CV as long as your arms. I'm not going to go into all that just for the moment. But I just want to clarify something. You're, you're saying this is a long-term problem and process, which it obviously is, but at the same time we do hear reports quite regularly now of coral bleaching, of all sorts of effects on the reef. So something is happening now as well as in the very long term. Oh, indeed. I, I'm the person who developed the method that's used to predict coral bleaching from satellite sea surface temperature data. I did that 20 years ago. We can calculate when and where bleaching will happen and how bad it will be before you can see it in the field. We've been able to do that for 20 years. Um, and in that intervening 20-year period, we've actually lost most of the corals in the world already to high temperatures. Now, the fact is, is that temperatures are going up. They're not going up in a smooth way. They go up with little glitches because the ocean circulation is not constant. And the difficulty is that the next time we get a record hot year, which statistically speaking will be 2010, but, you know, it might be 2011 or another year, but the next time we get a record hot year, um, we'll lose most of the corals we have left. So we're, we're essentially halfway through a mass extinction of coral reefs, and they just can't take any further warming. Now, what's and, and that matters because? Well, that matters because for over 100 countries, coral reefs are the major source of marine biodiversity, of fisheries, of food supply, of sand supply for beaches, the tourism that drives the economy of most tropical islands, and shore protection for the coastline. So, you know, we will lose huge amounts in the ecosystem services that they provide. We can't really calculate their value because we don't pay the reef for those services. But when they're gone, then we'll find out the true value. Yes, which might be rather devastating. It's devastating already because many places have lost almost all the reefs. I, I, I dive all around the world and, I mean, most places I go have hardly any corals left alive. So this is rather grim. I, just to, uh, can I just clarify something? Are, are you here, you're, you're a scientist, you're, you know, working, you're head of various organizations, you're a diver, I realize now. Mm -hmm. uh, are you working with uh, governments who are concerned about this uh, in the front line, I mean, small island states and so on? Well, yes, I, I'm on the Jamaican delegation. Uh, that Jamaica's my home island. Um, I'm not speaking for the Jamaican government here because really what I have to say is a little more alarming than politicians are ready to deal with, but um, a large part of my work for the last 20 years has been to try to alert small island states to the fact that um, they are the most vulnerable, they're going to be the first and worst victims, and they really need to defend their own long-term interests. Now, 
when I say long-term interests, you know, I, I, the issue here is that these are long-term changes. They're progressive. We're already seeing serious impacts, but we, we haven't begun to really feel the, the effects yet, and those are going to get progressively worse. And I, I think a realistic approach to the problem really requires that we be honest about the long-term impacts because that's what future generations will have to deal with, even long after our politicians are dead and can, you know, sidestep the blame. Okay, now I, I, our tireless uh, director, Peter Armstrong, has just told me that we can play, you have given us a short video, mm. and maybe you could just talk us over it as it, as, as it plays, or just right. uh, it, accentuate it, it some maybe points. Maybe worth um, discussing this a little bit further before we get to that? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm only worried about time, oh, so right, let, let's okay. try and do it at the same time. <laughs> we're, right. we're juggling so many things right. here. Well, well let, me, let me just say this, though. I mean, before we do that, uh, and this is the following, that... Um, when one looks at the real long-term climate sensitivity, um, for example, in my island we have the fossil sea level marked in our cliffs for the last interglacial period, and that, that is about 23 feet above today's sea level. Now, when that occurred, atmospheric CO2 was about 280 parts per million. Now, at that time, so it's more than one-third less than we have today. Now, at that time, London, England was a tropical swamp and had hippopotamuses and crocodiles. And you can go to the British Museum of Natural History and see those fossils. Copenhagen was underwater. The water level right here was, was up at the ceiling. And um, so, you know, people, people are worried about, you know, small changes, but in fact, the long-term ones we have to prepare for are much more severe. So th those changes are already in the pipeline. The, the equilibrium sea level, in a long-term sense, for today's level of CO2 is actually 23 meters or 75 feet above today's level. So therefore, the targets we need to protect coral reefs and low-lying coasts is going to be a CO2 level of, of something like around 260 ppm. So we need much more radical changes that are being discussed. And that, that means not just emissions reductions by converting to sustainable fuels, which you know, everyone's aware of here, that's a big discussion, but more than that, we actually have to draw down the existing excess of CO2, and that means we need carbon negative technologies, technologies that can actually remove CO2 from the atmosphere and store it safely, and, and such technologies exist.